Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's worship service. Very special welcome to you if you happen to be a visitor with us today. And if you are a first time visitor, we'd be delighted if we could welcome you more formally, if you'd be willing to uh, stand up and introduce yourself. Do we have any first time visitors with us? I am waving over there. Hi. Welcome, great to have you with us. Any others? Uh, those of you sitting in the pews close to the uh, Burgundy worship folders, if you haven't already, please take those out at this time and uh, <clears throat> begin to put your information in there. Uh, reminder that if you have a prayer need, go ahead and take one of those prayer request slips out and fill it out and hang on to it. And then as you leave worship this morning, there by the front doors, there's a box on a pedestal that has praying hands on it. You can put your prayer requests in there. They'll be gathered by our prayer ministers and prayed over throughout the week. And if you would like some private prayer time uh, with one of our prayer ministers, then at the conclusion of today's service, just gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. And someone will meet you there and pray with you. We do want to lift up in our prayers those known to have been hospitalized, Cliff Nichols and Evelyn Kepke. Also, I want to turn your attention to the back page of your bulletin. If you hadn't noticed, there's a lot of stuff in there. I'm going to encourage you to read through it carefully. But just a reminder that next Sunday is our, uh, our uh, rally day tailgate party. So uh, keep that in mind. And... Uh, wear your team colors and that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, we've uh, received several requests for, or uh, wondering, people wondering about what we're gonna do in regard to Hurricane Harvey and relief for those folks. So what we're gonna offer up to you is, is there's extra envelopes in there uh, in the pew racks, but if you would make a check out to American Lutheran Church, but in the memo line, uh, put uh, Hurricane Harvey Relief, and then on the envelope that you use also Hurricane Harvey Relief. We'll take those uh, checks, and then uh, after several weeks, we'll um, cut a check. And uh, there's information about uh, the, the Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ has a disaster response, and that's where we'll send that money to the folks down in Texas. Um, the Connections Education Hour has registration available today after the worship service, so please keep that in mind. I want to thank uh, Rod Schaefer in, in, uh, for our altar flowers today in honor of Maddie's 75th birthday. Are they at this service? Maybe next service. Um, and Ralph, do, are they here? Where are they at? Happy birthday. You got outed. And uh, Ralph Bunting, in memory of White Judy. Is Ralph at this service? Oh, okay. Um, Mike Mann. <laughs> I got tired of standing over there. I thought I'd yeah. come over here today. How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? Good. I, I, nice shirt. You know, Looking what you, good? What you'll probably see in a future newsletter is a picture of the two of us wearing the exact same shirt. And we've done this a couple of times now. These guys apparently are wives. So. They shopped... I think they shop together as, as well, as well. Good morning. I have a couple of announcements I'm gonna make. This will be the last organist announcement you'll hear me make for a while. The committee has met again. We've reviewed the, the documents and the position that we're sending out. We've reposted at a number of the major national sites that are excellent for, for finding qualified candidates. The committee has also expanded their search. We are looking at top universities and schools such as Baylor, St. Olaf, Lutheran, PLU, schools that produce students that go into church music ministry to see if there might be a student out there that would be qualified to come and serve with us. Uh, our anticipation is it'll take several months again like it did last time for us to receive resumes, review them, and begin the interview process. So. We just wanted to update you one more time before we go into a long period of, of looking uh, to keep you up to date. 
Also, this week, we kick off the music program. It's been posted and published, but we want to make sure everybody knows that if you are interested in serving in the music ministry in any way, shape, or form, this Wednesday at 5 o'clock, our, our peals of praise, our advanced handbook choir will start rehearsing. At 7 o'clock, Sanctus will begin rehearsing. Following the enormous success of this summer's music programming, we've adjusted how we're going to run our year-round program to mirror that. We had so many people join us for the women's choir, the men's choir, that we're going to wrap that all into one rehearsal as part of our Wednesday night program and have the women and men uh, do selections on their own throughout the year. We're also going to incorporate a wide variety uh, of, of soloists and ensembles into worship throughout the year as well because we've had requests to continue that. Then on uh, Thursdays, our, our uh, chancel chimers, our not-so-advanced uh, handbell choir, uh, our intermediate group, who is a wonderful group, is going to begin rehearsing at 2 o'clock. We would love to have anybody who is looking towards the music program to come and, and join us. And then our children's ministry, this is for you, Emma, this is for you. <laughs> Our youth, our youth choirs are going to be grades 5 through 12 this year. We're going to rehearse on Sundays right after church. Uh, it just seemed like Wednesdays last year we had a, a lower number, so we've had a lot of folks say the Sundays worked much better, and that is when we're going to be starting to look at that this year. When are you coming? Uh, well, listen, I, I've heard that uh, you guys have lowered the bar we a have. little bit. <laughs> and that uh, because you had so much trouble recruiting people that you no, no longer doing drug testing. We, we are not. <laughs> we are not. So you guys are finally clear, you know. <laughs> Looks like a pretty rowdy group, don't they? For, for Labor Day, We're I'm just glad they're We're tattoos, here. everything. <laughs> now. So there you go. That being said, at this time, I would invite you to stand as you are able. We'll quiet our minds and center our hearts and prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. We begin this uh, 13th Sunday after Pentecost in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by love, willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cry and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional. And we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. O God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point us to the path of obedience. And give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The reading is from Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it's September and that means a lot of things. And things uh, summer is just about behind us, fall's ahead of us. There's busy time of year. Um, but September's come to represent uh, something else for our nation. Uh, in a few days now, from now, we will once again commemorate another anniversary of those terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Once again, as a nation, we will lift up in prayer all those who perished and all those who sacrificed so much and all those who still grieve. And we will once again remember and honor the heroic efforts of hundreds and hundreds of men and women who risked their lives and, yes, even sacrificed their lives for the sake of others. And so we will honor fallen firefighters and police officers and emergency medical workers, also all those heroic passengers on all those doomed airliners. But we will also honor and remember those everyday Bobs and Bettys who stood by their fellow workers and friends, and yes, even complete strangers in a time of need, when they very well may have been able to escape if they'd been willing to put their own needs before the needs of the elderly, the injured, the disabled. And we will also remember and honor those men and women in our armed forces who have paid the ultimate price as they have gone to defend America against foreign enemies in a war that has now become the longest sustained military conflict in the history of our nation. But those amazing stories of self-sacrifice, 
are really nothing new. They have been around for as long as humankind has faced a sinful world. And one look at the news coming out of Texas this past week is a clear indicator to us that sacrifice remains an enduring human attribute. So maybe now, more than ever, I don't know, maybe now more than ever, the word sacrifice has become more a part of our American conscience. Sacrifice simply means to give up something of value for the sake of another. And of course, the ultimate sacrifice is to give up one's life for the sake of another. Jesus has said, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. That having been said, I know what some of you might be thinking, that that's all very well and good and even very admirable. But as a Christian, I have never been faced with that kind of situation in my walk of faith. God has never asked me to be a living sacrifice for someone else. I've never been faced with the desperate needs of victims in burning towers or ever been asked to risk my life for the sake of a complete stranger. Well, the truth is, um, if, if that's what being a living sacrifice is, burning towers and, and, and that sort of thing, well, neither have I. But I want you to understand that does not mean for a minute that God is not calling every Christian to be a living sacrifice. So that's what I want to look at a little bit this morning. What does it really mean for us to be a living sacrifice for God. I want you to listen again to what Jesus is saying in today's gospel reading. He says, if any want to be my disciple, then let them deny themselves. It sounds like sacrifice. Take up their cross. I can't think of a greater image of sacrifice than that. And follow me. So clearly every Christian is called to be a living sacrifice for the glory of God. Every follower of Jesus is called to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Um, the Apostle Paul certainly understood that in his day. In the 12th chapter of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and, and it's important that we understand that it is indeed the church in Rome, because we know that the Christians in Rome in particular were under a, a great deal of um, hardship. Um, they were being hunted down and, and tortured and sometimes killed for their faith. And this is what Paul is writing to those Christians. I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then Paul goes on to reveal to them what he means by this term, living sacrifice. He says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I mean, he's looking at a whole different kind of sacrifice here. He's basically saying that, you know, oftentimes it's easy to just go with the flow, to jump on the bandwagon, to, you know, whatever the rest of the world is doing, you do that. Um, but he says, I want you to be different. You are followers of Jesus. I want you to, to make a sacrifice. I want you to reject that kind of thing that would be so easy to do. And instead, I want you to be a different person. Have a different mindset, a different way of thinking, a different approach to the world. So let's get all this straight. Jesus says that every disciple is called to take up their cross. What that means for you will be unique to you. The Apostle Paul reminds us that followers of Jesus are to be a living sacrifice for God and others, just as Jesus was a living sacrifice for us. And Paul reminds us that in order for us to be a living sacrifice, 
then we need to do a couple things. One, conform our lives to the will of God as opposed to fitting in with the rest of the world and to reject the sinful false teachings of this world. Note there, there is nothing in what Paul writes there and nothing what Jesus says there, nothing about running into a burning tower to save somebody or taking a bullet for someone. To take up one's cross, to follow Jesus, to become a living sacrifice to God, according to Paul, means simply that we will conform our will to God's will, no matter what that costs us personally or professionally, or anywhere else in our, and that we will reject the ways of this world. And, and I tell you, I subject to you that that is something each and every one of us can do, and each and every one of us is challenged to do every day. So today I want to lift up for your consideration two essential transformations, changes, that must take place in the heart of every Christian so that they can indeed be a living sacrifice for God. They can indeed take up their cross and follow Jesus. Every Christian who wants to be a living sacrifice for God must undergo two fundamental changes in attitude. And the first is this. We must be willing to move from selfish ambition to being someone with the heart of a servant. And this is, without a doubt, countercultural. It absolutely is. In the book of James, James, the brother of Jesus, shares these cautionary words. He says, first of all, if you harbor bitter envy, you know, for what others have and you don't have, uh, and if you harbor selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast, for where you have both envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder. There you will find division. And, and what James is trying to tell us is, and this is indeed countercultural, James is saying that selfish ambition is what's keeping us from being a living sacrifice for God. To sacrifice means we give up something of value for the sake of another. Selfish ambition causes us to be unwilling to give up something of value for the sake of another. Compare what James says to what the words of, of Jesus are. Whoever would be great among you must first be your servant. Again, this is so countercultural. What does our culture tell us is greatness? It's, it's the amassing of wealth, the amassing of things. It's, it's, it's professional success. It's promotions. It's all, it's all these outer things that the world looks at. And, and Jesus says that's not what greatness is all about. Greatness is to be one with the heart of a servant. Which reminds me of a story. And I'm sure it's a true story because it is Oli and Lena are in the story. <laughs> That's always an indicator to you that it's a true story. I shouldn't even have to tell you. So Oli and Lena are on a vacation. They are taking a camping trip to a Yellowstone National Park. And they have uh, just sat down uh, to uh, their first campfire and campfire meal. They're, you know, cooking up their first plate of uh, Yellowstone Park lutefisk. And you, <laughs> nothing like lutefisk over the campfire, you know, <laughs> jellied fish over the campfire. Suddenly what they notice is, is that um, they're not the only person around uh, to enjoy the the aroma of the lutefisk. Apparently, it has also caught the attention of a very large and apparently also very hungry and apparently, in this case, very desperate grizzly bear who gets a whiff of this lutefisk and comes running toward them to get some of it. It's apparently a Norwegian grizzly bear, <laughs> Norwegian descent. 
Well, um, you, you can imagine how terrifying that picture is. And, and Ole quickly reaches down and he grabs his tennis shoes and he's feverishly trying to put them on as quick as he can. And, and, and Lena looks over to Ole and she says, Ole, do you really think you can outrun that grizzly bear? And Ole said, no, for heaven's sake, no, but I don't have to. All I need to do is outrun you. <laughs> And you know, we laugh, but the truth is, and I guess what I'm trying to get at in a very sort of sick way, is it, it seems that much of the world that we live in is simply trying to outrun the other guy. And, and that's complicated to some degree by the fact that, and I understand this, that we live in a world where competition is very much a, a way of life, right? We, you know, we, we compete for jobs and we compete for promotions and, and our kids are competing for awards and, and all that in, the, in sports and in school and we're competing for... I mean, from, it seems like from the day you're born till the day you die, you're, you're competing against someone else for something. And it's just, competition is so much a way of our life. Uh, but here's the important difference between the competition of the world, which is the competition born of envy, and which leads to division, and, and the competition that is born of the Spirit. And that kind of competition leads to great things accomplished for the glory of God. Scripture says, let your love be genuine. Outdo, sounds like competition, doesn't it? Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't lag in zeal, but be ardent in the spirit and serve the Lord. See, what the world says is you are in a competition against everybody else in the room to see who can get what they can get as if there might not be enough to go around. But spiritual competition is a completely different thing. It says, yeah, I want you to compete with one another, but I want you to compete with one another to outdo one another in acts of love, to outdo one another in acts of kindness. And that is the kind of competition that leads to glorifying God. So when we decide to be a living sacrifice for God, we quit trying to outrun the other guy, and instead what we try to do is we try to outlove them and outserve them. So that, when Jesus says, take up your cross, he's simply asking us to move from selfish ambition to moving to the place of having the heart of a servant. And every Christian is asked to do that, and every Christian can do that, and every Christian should do that. But selfishness is not the only thing that, that needs to change in the life and the heart of a disciple if they want to be a living sacrifice for God. The second fundamental change that has to happen in the heart of every Christian in order to be a servant for God and to take up their cross is they need to move from fear to trust. Moving from fear to trust. And more specifically, what I'm talking about is a movement from worldly fear, and, and that includes things like fear of failure or fear, fear of not you know, uh, measuring up or, or fear of not getting your share or, or fear, you know, a fear of rejection or just fear of the unknown, but moving from that kind of fear, worldly fear, to moving to trust in God. Because I tell you, fear is a major stumbling block if we want to take up our cross and, and follow Jesus. I share these words from the Apostle Paul, again, who is writing this letter to the church in Rome. And there was tremendous fear in the hearts of the Christians there for very good reason. But because there was so much fear, their faith was running under the radar. They were in hiding. And when, when you're in hiding and when you're, you're, you're not living out your life courageously in the world, then you can't do great things for God. 
And so this is what Paul says to them. Very real fears they're facing, persecutions. Um, he says, we should not be like cringeful, cringing, fearful slaves, but we should behave like God's own children. He says, I want you to quit living in fear. I want you to start living in courage. And you can do that because you are God's child. And he has claimed you, and he has your back, and he has a plan, and, and he's at your side. The world doesn't understand this. They think it's all up to them. I grab what I can grab. I do what I have to do because it's all up to me. And the Christian, they have a whole different understanding is, is that God will provide whatever it is I need. What I need to do is be the kind of person that God wants me to be in this world. One day in July, there was a farmer. He was sitting in front of his shack. He was smoking a corncob pipe. Along came a stranger, asked him, hey, how's your uh, cotton crop coming? And the old farmer looked up and said, I, I, didn't, I didn't plant any cotton this year. And the stranger said, oh, really? He says, no, no, I was, I was afraid of the bull weevil. Oh, he says, says the stranger, well then, uh, how's your corn crop this year? And the old farmer said, I, I didn't plant no corn this year. I was afraid of the drought. Well, said the stranger, well, how about your potatoes? And the old farmer said, I ain't got none of those either. I was afraid of them, they're tater bugs. Finally, the stranger said, well, what then did you plant? And the farmer said, nothing. I'm just playing it safe. <laughs> Can you imagine how ludicrous would that be? Uh, some of you know farmers, some of you have been farmers, you know, um, you know, my wife comes from a farming community in, in North Dakota, and, and there's no greater risk takers in the world, I swear, than farmers. Every, their life is one of risk, right? Every year they put the crop in the ground, and they don't know what's going to happen. And where she lives in that part of North Dakota, there's always tremendous risk of hailstorms coming in and wiping out the wheat crops and all that. I mean, these are people who live, farmers live on risk. They live on chance. They live on faith. Can you imagine a farmer who wouldn't be willing to live on faith? They couldn't do what they do. And what I'm suggesting to you is, is that if you're a Christian and you're not willing to live on faith, that's just as crazy. We will not be able to do what God has called us to do. To take up a cross, to follow Jesus, to be a living sacrifice for him, means that we have to meet the uncertainties of tomorrow. And I understand there are a lot of them, but we have to meet those uncertainties with faith, not fear. Because nothing worthy of Christ was ever accomplished by playing it safe, by giving into fears, and insecurities. So what I want to do is leave you this morning with two very important questions. Questions for you to consider as you contemplate your life as a disciple and what it means to take up your cross and to follow Jesus. My first question is this, what of value? Because remember, sacrifice is giving something of value for the sake of another. What of value is God calling you to unselfishly and fearlessly give up to sacrifice for his sake and for the sake of the gospel? Is it time? Is it talent? Is it financial resources? Is it something completely different? But I guarantee you, there's something out there. God has entrusted you with tremendous resources. And he expects you to use them for his glory. And the devil is going to try to keep you from doing it all the time. The second thing is this. How has or how is selfish ambition um, 
the kind of worldly selfish ambition we talked of, and, and a lack of trust and faith in God, how has that kept you, or how is it keeping you from experiencing a deeper, more committed relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Because, you know, if we're not willing to take a risk, I mean, the, the greatest moments of growth in my faith have been times when I've taken the greatest risk for God and watched God work incredible miracles in my life. May God's Holy Spirit help each of us to grow more and more into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is, that we would have, as he says, a heart of a servant. That we would trust completely in the power and the promise of our Heavenly Father so that we could be what he has called us to be, a living sacrifice for him. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, um, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. We will sing our hymn of the day, which is printed in your bulletin, Take Up Your Cross. Let us profess our faith now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Abba Father, your son offered his body as a sacrifice for us. The least we can do is offer this earthly vessel back to you. Transform us to be more and more like Jesus. Change our will to align with yours. Give us hearts ready for service. We give you our minds to be cleansed so that we are no longer fearful, cynical, critical, or lacking in empathy. We give you our hearts to be led by you and willing for service. Lead us, Lord, for you are our God. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Father, let your mercy fall with hope and healing on all the victims of the devastating hurricane and flood waters. Provide peace and willing souls to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We ask for protection and stamina for all first responders and citizens who are putting their lives on the line to rescue and care for others. We lift up in prayer Cliff Nichols, Evelyn Kepke, and Virginia Harder, who have been hospitalized, and all whom we silently name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, give our nation's leaders compassionate hearts and godly wisdom to mend this country. Soften their hearts, and by your Spirit's prompting, may their words and deeds sow seeds of love and healing instead of divisiveness and hatred. Let us all unite as one nation under God so that we not are overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, generous God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. Please be seated. At this time, we invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. May they be used for God's glory.
God of life, you give us these gifts of the earth, these resources of our life and our labor. Take them offered in great thanksgiving and use them to set a table that will heal the whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and then he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit that by this holy communion we may know the unity that we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And so we pray that prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Speak to us, O Lord, in the breaking of the bread and make us one with you.